Mark, today is the first day of the rest of Donald Trump's presidency, a presidency that will forever be remembered in terms of before and after. Everything that happened before the president's former fixer, Michael Cohen, implicated the president for directing payments to two women before the 2016 election goes in one column, and everything, everything that happens now goes in the after column. Donald Trump stumbled into this new reality with only one certain source of reassurance, his belief that a sitting president can't be indicted. Just about everything else, from the outcome of the Mueller investigation into obstruction of justice, one in which the president may very well be a target, not just a subject, is unknown. The outcome of Mueller's investigation into whether there was a conspiracy between the Trump campaign and Russia is also unknown. And the fallout for the president from Michael Cohen's stunning testimony yesterday that Donald Trump ordered those hush money payments, a clear campaign finance violation, also unknown. The New York Times reports on the mood inside the Trump West Wing in the aftermath of a devastating news day. Quote, inside the West Wing, aides to Mr. Trump, numbed and desensitized by breathless news cycles, blaring headlines about the president's behavior, said privately on Tuesday that they were having trouble assessing how devastating the day's legal events might be. The Times also reporting on Cohen and Manafort's new potential usefulness to Robert Mueller. The cases of both men are at the moment tangential to the central questions of Mr. Mueller's, Mueller's inquiry, whether President Trump and his associates conspired with Russia's election interference, and whether the president tried to obstruct the Justice Department's investigation. But neither Mr. Manafort nor Mr. Cohen are believed to be cooperating with the special counsel situations that could change now that they face years in prison. For his part, Donald Trump took to Twitter, writing, quote, if anyone is looking for a good lawyer, I would strongly suggest that you don't retain the services of Michael Cohen. Here to help us understand just what happens next, some of our favorite reporters and friends, former U.S. Attorney and former Deputy Assistant Attorney General Harry Littman, with us at the table from the New York Times, Mike Schmidt, Eli Stokels, White House reporter for the L.A. Times, Emily Jane Fox, who was up as late as I was last night, I don't know, maybe later, um, senior reporter for Vanity Fair, who recently spoke extensively with Michael Cohen, and Heilman's back, NBC News and MSNBC National Affairs Analyst. Let me start with you. You um, spoke to Michael Cohen yesterday after this dramatic day in court. Did he realize that what he was saying, I think it was count seven and eight, would leave all of us, um, really, as some of those White House aides described, breathlessly covering the president as possibly an unindicted co-conspirator? That was the point. He went in there with a set of notes that were written down. He said in court that they were to keep his mind focused. But there is another intention there, and that was to throw a man who had thrown him under the bus, under a bus of his own. And I think that what Lanny Davis, his attorney, has said in multiple television appearances since has, has been, let's focus on counts seven and eight. Forget one through six, which are counts of tax evasion and lying to a bank. But let's focus on seven and eight because they throw the president under the bus. So that is the message that Michael Cohen wanted to get across. That is the message that his attorney has been pushing ever since. And it's very clear that that's the message he's going to push going forward. And how they don't just throw him under the bus. I mean, that's what the president has been doing to Michael Cohen for, it would appear, and based on some of your colleague Maggie Haberman's reporting from the spring, the entire duration of their relationship. He implicated him in what is being um, talked about, not in a hyperbolic resistancy way, but by legal experts as potentially high crimes and misdemeanors. Right. Well, so I'd, I'd like to, in your opening uh in your opening statement, you, you referred to it as clear violation of campaign finance law. I would like to be Jeremy Bash now and say, <laughs> just like we shouldn't talk about collusion, we should talk about conspiracy. We should not talk about this as a campaign finance violation. Yes, it, no, violates, campaign, it violates campaign finance law. What happens in, in October of a presidential election year if a presidential nominee goes to his personal lawyer and asks for a payoff to keep an embarrassing story that could sway the election one way or the other is an attempt to defraud the American people and, 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 all, and defraud the democratic process. Yes, the law in question is a campaign finance violation, but what's really going on there, this is not a narrow technical thing. It's not like somebody forgot to report. Yeah. Somebody gave a little bit more than the, 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 the minimum. Uh, some PAC uh, didn't, didn't follow a, law, a, a small regulation. This is a fundamental thing. The, the nominee at the closing days of the campaign, when he thought his campaign was on the line and a story or two stories potentially threatened his nomination, went and said, I got to make this story go away, according to Michael Cohen, and said, go make this go away and pay for it. I think that's 
goes is not in a resistancy way at all, but goes <laughs> is a much more dramatic and much more accurate way of stating what actually happened there. And yes, it could be, it implicates the president yeah. in the commission of a felony, but it also implicates the president in uh, in what is now a growing sense that a lot of people have, and not just resistance people, that this is one more way in which the 2016 election was fakakta. Um, Harry Littman, we're in dangerous territory here. Two non-lawyers talking about how what may be under investigation in the Southern District is a conspiracy. But that's, th that is a pretty clear parallel to what we are told by, by folks like yourself about the Mueller investigation and that it's not collusion. Collusion in and of itself isn't the crime. It would have been the conspiracy to impact the election. Do you think that is what the Southern District is investigating when it comes to these hush money payments? Do you think that's what they went in looking for? We know from the day of the that that's what one of the things they were looking for when they seized items from Michael Cohen's homes and offices? Well, look, they were probably looking for the whole mother load of financial misdeeds that they found, but they also found this point, and I can't say strongly enough, John is so dead on here. They are the second defense of Team Trump now is, oh, a technical campaign finance violation. That, that makes it seem ministerial. It's the exact opposite, and it's what really gives rise to the sort of Watergate comparisons. What Cohen says in court, and by the way, it's not in the information, he made a point of saying it, is not only that it was at the direction of Trump, but it was for the purpose of influencing the election. That gets down the middle in the bullseye of high crime and misdemeanor land, especially given how excruciatingly close the election was. It's quite like what the Watergate burglars did, except Nixon was up 25 points against McGovern. That is a serious corruption of governmental function and of the election, and it has to be thought of in those terms. In terms of going forward, I think they, there, there will be much to say about the Mueller investigation, but Cohen will be saying that to Mueller, and it will go on two tracks, the kind of money track that's now at the SDNY, but he will also be cooperating, I think it's clear, with the Mueller probe. It's, it's been, I was going to say it's been a long week, but it's only Wednesday. But the president's week started with your reporting over the weekend that Don McGahn has spent more than 30 hours with the special counsel. Tuesday, he got the twin bombshells, the Manafort guilty verdict, and the Cohen plea. I, I, I understand from all of your reporting on the obstruction of justice investigation, there's a lot of angst in the president's legal team. We put together the way the president has answered questions just on this Michael Cohen question of payments, and it certainly explains their angst around an interview. Let's watch and talk about it on the other side. Michael Cohen, as far as I know, is a long-standing agreement that Michael Cohen takes care of situations like this, then gets paid for them sometimes. Gets paid for them sometimes, it's reimbursed in another way. It depends on whether it's business or personal. It's not campaign money. No campaign finance violation. So, so they, they funneled it through the law firm. Funneled through the law firm, and then the president repaid it. Oh, I didn't know he did. Yeah. I'll forever love the <laughs> reaction. But, but it's just the evolution of a response on a question that's at the center of a pretty serious prosecution now in the Southern District. How, how is the legal team managing the shifting fact patterns? Well, they've long thought that the New York part of this was the more troubling one because they didn't understand it. They've claimed to understand the four corners of the Mueller investigation and thought the president was in an OK spot. But all along, they never thought they got straight answers from the president about this. And they never thought that they understood the full extent of the president's relationship with Michael Cohen. So as this has gone forward, they have really, really been in the dark. This is not like the Mueller investigation where the president's lawyers have come in and been read through the questions that the prosecutors want to ask and had an understanding of what's there. This has all gone on with them knowing very little. It's also not been smeared the way the Mueller investigation has been smeared. So you've talked about how they feel inoculated from whatever the outcome of the witch hunt is. This is not something that falls under the broad category of a witch hunt. One of the great mysteries of this story is it why is it that Rod Rosenstein did not give Mueller this aspect of the case and gave it to the prosecutors in the Southern District. By doing that, it insulated Mueller from some of the 
criticisms that he truly is on an unending witch hunt that's looking at all sorts of things that have nothing to do with Russia. So these career prosecutors who do not have political faces, that do not have the public images that Mueller has, have gone in and done this case. So what does the president say? Is this part of the witch hunt? Is it a different, is it a Justice Department wide thing? It insulated Mueller. Do you think, Eli, that the fact that this is getting more sprawling, not less, the fact that there are enemies within, the people that, are, if the president doesn't make it, if the president is ever impeached in the House, it will not be um, the 17 angry Democrats that he tweets about. It'll be his former campaign chairman, Paul Manafort. It will be um, his former fixer and personal attorney, Michael Cohen. It will be Mike Flynn, who's been a cooperating witness for uh, many, many months now. It, it will be his own inner circle that gave federal prosecutors and investigators evidence against him. There have been a lot of people indicted, right? I don't know if you heard the press secretary today. The president did nothing wrong, Nicole, so I don't know why we're talking about impeachment. Um, but seriously, this is a problem. This is a growing investigation, and it keeps metastasizing. It keeps getting bigger and bigger. And no matter what the White House says, they're struggling to control it. They're struggling to, the, the attorneys, as Mike said, they don't know all the answers. They don't necessarily trust the president. And part of why this has gotten worse and worse is because the president continues to talk. The president, every little thing that bubbles up in the press, he has to respond to it. He has to answer. And he answers these questions with a very sort of short-term focus on getting past the story. So when the president has done that over and over again, you see him on Air Force One saying he knew nothing about the payment. Well, now we've heard Michael Cohn and the president on tape discussing the payment. We know that was a lie. And even if the White House says it's a ridiculous accusation to say that he's lying, the whole country can see that he's lying. And so the president himself, uh, who's told thousands of falsehoods over the course of his presidency so far on matters big and small, is not very trustworthy uh, and, and, and does not have a lot of credibility on this matter because we've seen already so many big and small efforts to mislead the American public and, and investigators as well. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.